And I'm recording. We're good now, right? <laughs> yes. Sure. Yes. <laughs> hey. Hey. So, um, we're going to talk about women's health today. Uh, what I want you to um, think about when you're looking at this stuff, this is really broad. Okay, it's very, very broad. Basically, all my stuff's really broad this semester. If you're not getting pregnant and having a baby and everything else that I'm teaching. So, when I designed your um, learning, objectives, I gave you really specific page numbers. You can read all the chapters you want to read. You can memorize anything you want to memorize. But I really want you to focus on the pages that I gave you. Some of it is med search. It's meant to complement. If you find one little detail that's different, don't spot that. Right? Med search is necessary because there's not a test to go anything like this. Okay? It is a baby. So some of the stuff has to come from that other book. So, um, I just wanted you to see that there are some parent contrast opportunities there. That's the big takeaway pieces. The reason I gave you the terms to know is because basically this whole section is a bunch of words. If you're comfortable with the usage of those terms and the application of those terms, you'll be fine. Remember, knowledge is kind of out of the way now. We're on that higher level thinking. So don't make a bunch of flashcards. That's a waste of your time. As we move through this material today, understanding what the word means and how it would apply to this population as well. Okay. Um, that's, I think, the big stuff. There's a lot of nice to know in here versus these to know, you know about that? It's real nice to know all about that assistive reproductive technology we're going to talk about after a while. Do you need to know that to pass the NCLEX? I don't know. Okay. So I'll try to point some of that stuff out to you because you've got some really heavy content in addition to women's health on your test coming up next week. Um, we're going to think in broad terms what the nurse needs to know about a woman, period. Don't forget you also have um, next week's test will also have three developmental states, preschooler, school age, and adolescent. And what's nice about some of this material is that adolescent and that um, Free stage where we're developing the sexual characteristics and we move on into having a menstrual cycle, and that's kind of where this material starts at. Okay, any burning questions about that? Mm -hmm. um, the bulk of the women's health stuff is in that Ricci book, chapters four or five, I believe six. You'll see. I mean, it's um, the screenings, mostly that's what we're going to focus on later is the health screenings for this. It's like the breast cancer chapter, but we don't want breast cancer until you're a senior. So prep you is going to be a jump around sort of thing. Right, and I would use your reach book for this, not so much a med search because you will have that opportunity to further this later on and you'll want the material. Um, chapter four is Birth control, we're going to do that next week. Chapter 5 is STDs, we're going to do that next week too. So it will, again, fold together eventually. But right now, just kind of stay where I push you. And don't go way deep up in this. Okay, we're going to go deep up in this. Okay, we're going to go deep up Lower day, I'm going to tell you, there ain't a lot of fire in here this morning. I'm going to need you to help. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you people have toddlers. I just think they're good. Oh, okay. So yeah. I can't hear the specific question. It's been a question. Yeah. Everything, Everything else is working. <laughs> this is a little too much for my simple mind. <laughs> well, actually, that, that should have been all along, but uh, the other mic picked it up better because they were talking to you. Now the microphone's back here in the camera. Okay. So when they talk to the front, it doesn't come back. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I'm struggling. I've slept a lot since Monday. I sent y'all the email. My daughter did have a baby. It was four weeks, a little over four weeks early. Everybody's fine. They came home yesterday afternoon. But, um, you know, Monday I got up at 4 45 to go to Union Peas. I found my bed again six something on Tuesday morning after the toddler, who's two and a half, had slept all night. And I've had her since then. So, um, Right now, and I was like, baby diapers and infant weight. So, um, clearly, not going to tell. So, yeah, this is too much. Yeah. Yeah, this is too much, too much. 
All right, so repeat the questions. I'll try to try to do that. I'm also trying this out because I'm, we're changing our technology, so I'm trying to this out. So I keep myself on track. You know, we just might as well go back home, right? All right, so uh, the question was BCM prep you, um, or prep you, not BCM. And I said, just kind of see your reach book for right now. Some of this material is deeper than you're going to go. And just really stay with the PowerPoints, guys. You know, I can't encourage that. Okay, I'm trying to be really fair because you know what? Okay, so <laughs> menstrual cycle. We are going to um, kind of pick up our discussion of the menstrual cycle based off of your antepartum lecture. So in antepartum, you talked about girl parts, boy parts, and the menstrual cycle, and how all those hormones play into that. To recap that, I provided you an osmosis video. Mr. Washburn didn't want me to tell you there's a few variances there. So if you should look, you see something really, really big, and you're not sure if your book, of course, is the Bible. Um, we are not, this, this section isn't so much about the menstrual cycle and the hormone release. You've already been tested on that. That is a nice review for your, your final exam, but this is a lead into the menstrual dysfunction topics that we're going to talk about today. So, um, we all know that your menstrual cycle is that normal process where your endometrium is shed from the body, very much hormone driven, and it occurs each month. What The average age is um, 12.8 years old. There's lots of changes that go on in the body before that occurs. So that is that adolescent developmental stuff that I gave you. That'll pull it all together. What we're gonna look at today is what happens when this cycle is abnormal, the problems that can occur from this cycle, and then that'll lead on into some infertility topics. So really understanding this cycle is super important to be able to apply the abnormalities, okay? Um, how long should your menstrual cycle last? Yeah, shouldn't be super, super long. So some of these terms are about crazy long menstrual cycles and heavy amounts of blood loss. What's the average blood loss for a menstrual cycle? By done? How much? Like 30 to 50. Yeah, like 30 to 50 milliliters max over the whole you know, window of time. So heavier blood flow is one of those words we're going to look at today and the concerns that we may have. Um, your menstrual cycle should start out dark, dark red and then get lighter as time progresses, right? Should it really have a Foul odor? No, we don't talk about foul odors next week, okay? That's like tricky, I'll try to keep my face intact. Um, should not have a very strong or foul odor. Most people have a menstrual cycle, most females have a menstrual cycle every month without any kind of problems, right? It should not be crazy painful, it shouldn't really interfere with life, it's just something that occurs. Sometimes there are problems associated with that. It's the nurse's role to really do some really good education. So you may end up working as a school nurse or in a pediatric office where you're going to encounter that adolescent who's not sure about their cycle. Not all parents have that level of um, comfort. They want to be able to talk about this for you. And if you're a school nurse, remember who taught your, your sex classes in high school or your elementary school? This is a school nurse primarily. So you need to be able to um, teach young females about this process. What do you think are some important takeaways other than what I've got listed there? The premenstrual counseling. What do you want to teach them? Wash your hands. Hand hygiene, absolutely. Before and after you're down there manipulating. Because the transfer of bacteria from your hands in a warm, dark, moist place causes really bad things to grow, right? What else? Changing those pads frequently, absolutely. What about the perineum itself? Should it be washed? And more frequently during that time frame too, because you remember old blood breeds germs? That's blood transfusions, right? What a great place for germs to grow, in a warm, dark, moist area where there's a little trickle of dead tissue coming out of them on a regular basis. So teaching that front to back is super important, right? 
What about swimming? And take the last. Is it okay to get go swimming or take a walk around the other side? I know we have a lot of girls in this room, but we're gonna be nurses, so we talk about it, right? Is it okay? It is okay. Might not be the best time, right? Who wants to get bubble back with all that going on? But it's not contraindicated, and some young females don't understand that. If they're going swimming, is it a deal to have a paddle? No, that would be the time you'd want to keep them out of the swimming pool. But otherwise, it is absolutely fine to go swimming during that time frame. Um, but that hygiene is super important. What about the use of uh, vaginal sprays or douching? Is that okay? It does. It messes up your pH. It's really contraindicated. Shouldn't necessarily need those. So if the young female has concerns about a smell, you might need to do some more detailed examination and reminding her to the bottom point to keep herself clean and making sure she's changing her pads frequently. It does change the pH and that leads into problems that we'll talk about next week, bacterial vaginosis. So we want those are contraindicated. We want to try to figure out why they feel the need to use those and what's going on. Is there other counseling that they need or the things that we need to be doing differently? Pads and tampons. They need to be taught how to use those, right? Not, you don't come out knowing how to do that. Um, younger females sometimes are intimidated by the use of a tampon and don't really understand how to use them. And they might confide more in a nurse than they would their own parents. So bottom line on those two products are change frequently, right? Wash your hands before and after. You shouldn't saturate that pad and walk around that way because again, old blood breeds germs. So change the pad in a couple of hours or the tampon. The size of tampons, they matter, right? There's life A all the way up to super plus, 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 something else, right? Young females don't want, they need to be told not to put them in there leave it all day long. Even on their live days, they might not be the biggest thing on the market because what happens? It sits in there and it accumulates germs and it can lead to the next problem that we don't look at. Okay? So, hand hygiene, good perineum care, really important. They learn that. And then to change these things frequently, about every four to six hours, or more frequently if your flow is heavier, they need to be taught to track their cycle. Do we want to know the first day of their cycle or the last day of their cycle? First day. So teach them about their apps, take them on their phones. Regardless, we already know this. First thing we want to know when you go to the doctor's office is when was the first day of your last menstrual period, right? We don't matter the last day, it doesn't really matter. And then we want to know about abnormal symptoms in between. So all of those are our role when it comes to the menstrual cycle. Now this is why we have to teach them to change their tampons and pads a little more frequently. This is a form of septic shock. It can lead to that. Toxic shock syndrome. It used to be more common um, when tampons were scented. They don't really know why. Research has shown there's a, um, a connection between staph and strep bacteria and the fact that they stay up inside of the female a little longer. Okay, so if the young female is wearing the super tampon, on a light flow day, so that she doesn't have to change for eight to 12 hours, she is putting herself at risk for this problem. So we need to make sure she understands that. This is life threatening. This goes from zero to death really, really fast. And I've actually seen this a couple of times in my own practice. So think about things like this. When you have a young female present with a really high fever, because that is one of the signs, this classic rash, the bottom picture, it will be on the palms of their hands, up in their wrist palms of their feet, and they'll, their tongue has this white patchy appearance to it. And it starts pretty rapidly. They'll say, I was fine, and I start kind of feeling achy, and I've noticed this rash. But if it's not cold in time, it will progress. They can seize and even die. And 10 years ago, this was a more common occurrence than it is now. And it's because of the education. You know, the females have been taught, don't wear those great big large tampons all day long. Change them frequently, that hand hygiene, all those things that we just talked about, will help to decrease the risk of this. Also, every time you buy us tampons, what's in the top? Information sheet telling you that same information, the real basics. 
So if you are in an environment where you see this, what do you think the best thing to do is? First thing we need to do, remove it. That's exactly right. Because now we've removed the problem. But then remember, it's a form of septic shock. So this person needs large volumes of fluid, they need antipyretics, they're gonna get broad spectrum antibiotics because we don't know staff or strep. They know that there's a link there, but they don't necessarily know why. Um, this person can recover, but again, it has to be caught in time. So the education is critical. The skin will peel just after this is over, the skin on the palms and the um, feet will peel. It's kind of crazy to see what happens. And it's real rapid. It's not like two or three days. It's a couple of hours of onset from the symptoms. Another thing to consider with this process, I've talked to ICU friends who have had this occur because they've had a female who's been in a car accident. Think about this. We don't get up and plan to go and wreck our cars, all right? Maybe they got a fully catheter inserted at the same time they got intubated. Nobody bothered to part those ways and see what was up in there. And this female spikes the fever. And they start thinking and looking and determining. And tampons can be found on the inside. So remember back in 111, we said the good nurse will ask and the great nurse will look, right? So you need to be thoughtful of that and make sure you know that there's nothing up in there for the slide to leave away, okay? Because we could also cause this with some of our interventions. Questions about toxic shock? This is covered slightly in your med search book, just a little, but that's the big stuff, the risk factors, the education. And then the medical management's just good to know. You'll learn more about septic shock as you see, or all shocks as you see. Okay. All right, I gave you terms to know because now we got to know these problems that can occur with the menstrual cycle. So when you have a letter A in front of anything, what does it mean? With that, apnea without breathing, right? A systole without a heartbeat. So amenorrhea means the absence of a menstrual cycle during the reproductive years. Now, the first slide, we know that the average onset of a menstrual cycle is 12.8 years old. That's young, I feel like, right? But by um, the age of 15, your textbook says about 98% of the population, female population should have started their cycle. So there are two types of amenorrhea. There's primary and secondary amenorrhea. Primary is the absence of a period by age 14, but they also have the absence of those secondary sexual characteristics. So they don't have breast buds yet. They've not developed hair in their armpits or in their uh, genital areas. They've not gone through those changes. Their, their silhouette, their female silhouette is not starting to soften up and take shape and form. That can be normal. As time goes on though, we start to get a little more worried. When they reach 16 and they have had the normal development of the sexual characteristics and still haven't had a menstrual cycle, it might be a good time to start wondering, is there a problem? Remember, to have a cycle, all your female parts have got to be working, right? You've got to have a good hormone release, so that means the pituitary gland's got to be thrown out, the FSH, and all those other hormones that have to occur. Your ovaries have to be functioning, your uterus has to be functioning, the endometrium has to be there. So there has to be this whole process going on for normal um, cycles to occur. So primary amenorrhea is usually your younger females. We're gonna look at the causes in a minute, look straight at how you look and you have those. Secondary amenorrhea is the absence of, the three, of your period after you've had three cycles or six months in women who have regularly had cycles. So remember, when they first start having a period, it takes about two years for it to regulate. So again, this could be normal. This could just be that 14-year-old who started when she was 12. It's not quite even out yet. Or there could be other causes to it. These are straight in your book, okay? If you open up your reach book and you look at the word, Primary amenorrhea, they're bulleted for you. They're that easy to find, okay? I wasn't sure I was gonna be here today, so I had gone in and started typing these all up to share with you in another format. So I have more words on mine than you do. 
All right, so prosocols is a primary amenorrhea. Nutrition plays a huge role in having a menstrual cycle. Someone who's malnourished can have a problem with the cycle. Okay? So we always want to think about that. Young teenage girls, they're really small, and they get these images off of TV, they're supposed to be real small, and they can be going through like anorexia or bounce problems like that. So we think about that. They may need nutritional counseling. If everything medically checks out, then we think about a dietary habits and nutrition. But there could be some congenital abnormalities in the reproductive system. Clearly, we have to do some testing to figure that out. Stress. Anybody ever had real stressful events going on in your life and it just kind of causes everything else? That can happen. Um, so we want to try to get in there and dig out the cause. Excessive exercise. Did you realize that could also pose a change in your menstrual cycle? So we just want to make sure that we know, we understand what's going on and we're doing a good job asking questions to these young females if they present. And then some of these problems have to be ruled out, like hypothyroidism. We're going to need to draw some blood to figure out is there a problem with thyroid levels? Is the hormone, is the uh, pituitary gland functioning properly? The big ones that your book notes are the weight loss, stress, chronic illness, clearly, exercise, and then tumors. So remember, primary is the 14-year-old with no sexual characteristics, or the 16-year-old that has the sexual characteristics but is not starting to have a cycle yet. Versus secondary amenorrhea. So this is the person who's had a cycle for three months normally, and then they've skipped it, or they haven't had a cycle in about six months after they were normal, right? Look at the very first cause of secondary amenorrhea. Pregnancy, right? The obvious. So always think about those questions. When you have a female patient, it is a very valid question and part of your intake and your history and review is when was your last menstrual cycle? And when they can't recall, pregnant, right? That's certainly something to consider because that is the main cause of secondary amenorrhea. They can also be breastfeeding, that does suppress your cycle for a while. Again, emotional stress, the exercise is here again, along with eating disorders, and then um, those major uh, medical issues that can complicate, complicate things. Secondary amenorrhea can also be the introduction to menopause for some females. Don't assume, based on how someone looks, their age or whether or not they're having a period. That's like, don't assume somebody's pregnant, right? You ever done that one more? Oh, I didn't know you were having a baby. I'm not pregnant, right? So, you know, I'm 25, because I say so, mentally. Physically today, I'm 125. Um, so, I would hope that if I came to see you, you'd say, what's your last menstrual cycle? No, you still having a period? Because we, we don't want to make pass that type of judgment, okay? So just be open with it. Now, I ask them, I don't care if you're 65, I just say, you still have a cycle. I don't go by the number, I let them tell me. And then you can dig into that a little deeper. Secondary name and already use them when they can write it right. Right? And then when we think about you and take it out. And then as I told you already, your book points out the bigger things, the pregnancy, the eating disorders, the excessive exercise, in addition to comorbidities. Most of these things have to be ruled out with diagnostic testing. We don't want to just assume a 50-year-old female is going through menopause. If there's a change in her cycle, then we need to rule out and we're going to look at diagnostic testing by itself later on, okay? See, this just kind of is what it is, right? They ain't not fun, I don't get to drop nothing on the floor, it's almost kind of boring. So take it for what it is. It's really that easy. All right, the management of amenorrhea. This pretty much is what it is, correct the underlying problem. If this is a young female who's not started her cycle and all of her reproductive parts are intact and her hormone levels are adequate, she just may need some estrogen replacement to get that kick started. But again, we'd have to do a lot of testing to be able to determine that. So we're not just going to say, okay, here's a prescription for estrogen. Secondary amenorrhea, um, your book, these again, straight out of your book. Don't work too hard for them, they're right there, bulleted for you to see. 
Um, basically, again, it's treat the cause. That's about all today, all your medical management is going to say over and over again. Treat the underlying cause. You've got to figure out which one of these is the problem so that we know how to hit it. So maybe they just think of hormones to regulate out that time frame. What does um, an ovulation mean? The word A, A in front of anything, you're not ovulating. You can stop a cycle and not necessarily ovulate. So we'd have to determine is there an ovulation going on? So sometimes just uh, regulating out the hormone balance with some birth control pills or other hormones can take care of that. Here's the nutritional counseling again. That really could go on either one of those. Um, and then hormone replacements if this is a thyroid or hormone imbalance. All right, dysmenorrhea. You see the word dys in front of something, what does that mean? Painful. Painful. So this is painful um, periods, basically. There's a myth out there that you're supposed to be miserable and have pain when you have your cycle. And you've heard that's really not the case. So this isn't an occasional menstrual cramp every now and then. This is something that really alters that person's ability to function because they're, in, they're having so much pain and discomfort. Um, you know, this is kind of funny sometimes in my opinion, but I do see people come to my department and want some more pain for the menstrual cycle. So I'm like, what? But, you know, I'm a nurse. I have to advocate for your care. And I'll be like, did you try some Tylenol or smell of meal first? But some people can be a little more dramatic than others, right? So you have to kind of assess for that and make sure that they're not just um, out for a good time. But dysmenorrhea is painful, and it usually is more common in adolescents, especially early on because there's the surge of hormones where they're trying to regulate and balance. And the prostaglandins are really what causes these cramping type pain. So you'll hear about this more in the younger population or this um, intense pain. Your book talks about two types, primary and secondary. Primary is um, there's the spasms that go on. It's due to that increased prostaglandin production. But there's no pathology, meaning there's no problem in there. There's not um, endometriosis like there would be with secondary. There's no problems with the ovaries. It's not like there's a cyst on the ovaries that's causing this increased pain and discomfort. So it's just increase in uh, prostaglandin production, and it's usually that hormone balance. Versus secondary um, dysmenorrhea is defined, your book calls it congestive. It's an excessive prostaglandin production. So not just increase, this is an overabundance, which causes, again, the intense uterine contractions, which can cause that pain. But there's usually some pelvic or urine, um, uterine pathology involved, and endometriosis is the most common cause of secondary dysmenorrhea in an older female. So primary, more common in the younger ones. Think about this across the lifespan versus secondary is more common in the um, older women. We're going to look at endometriosis by itself in just a minute as well, okay? So this is another one of those things that cause is going to be depending on a little more testing. We're going to have to ask some questions. They may complain of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fatigue, fever, a whole host of other symptoms. But this isn't just that occasional cramping pain. This is interferes with their ability to function. Okay? Just they're in so much pain they can't even get up out of the bed sort of type of discomfort, not your usual occasional cramping right there. So the medical management. This is another one of those real vague. What you gonna do about it? We get the problem is first and then treat it. The goal here is pain control and these comfort measures so they can resume normal activities because how normal is it for a female to be out of commission for two or three days every single month, right? Not really. So heating pads tend to work. That'll vasodilate a little bit, right? Bring some blood flow into that area and help with um, pain. Lifestyle changes, caffeine, smoking, some of those can cause it. In fact, smoking is tagged to the cause of dysmenorrhea. So we want to cut down on some of that. Salty foods, and we all have those cravings from time to time, chocolate, salt, whatever. But balance is really important. 
because if they're taking that excessive salt intake in, and they've got this excessive fluid intake in, that can actually be causing a heart problem. Exercise. A little exercise goes a long way. We're going to talk about exercise all the way through today. It's super important. Because if they're getting that regular exercise, not excessive exercise, because that's going to cause an amenorrhea, right? But if they're getting regular exercise, that's proven to help out. Um, adequate fiber intake. So all these came straight from your textbook, okay? NSAIDs typically, typically are the best pain reliever here. Do you know why? What are NSAIDs? Prostaglandin inhibitors. So the root of the problem is prostaglandins. So NSAIDs are your best friend with menstrual pain because it suppresses the thing that's causing the pain, that intense contractions from that excessive amount of prostaglandins. So NSAIDs really need to be started a couple of days before the cycle and continue throughout. Usually the pain with dysmenorrhea peaks um, about the time the flow is the heaviest, and then it starts to go away. So if a female will track her symptoms and start taking Motrin, Aleve, Ibuprofen a few days before onset of the cycle, then it has been proven to decrease the pain and discomfort and even the length of the period. So that's a good one to know, right? Now, maybe hormone replacements and complementary therapies, um, things like calcium, vitamin D, magnesium. That's another one of those, there's really no why. I don't really understand how necessarily some of these things work. Those have been proven to be beneficial, especially to an older female um, moving on into menopause when the cycle changes. Stopping smoking and decreasing alcohol, all those are also listed here. And then of course, there are some herbal remedies, but um, gotta be careful of those, right? And to do your best right here. All right, the next dysfunction that we're gonna look at is abnormal uterine bleeding, AUB. Just um, a side note here, your med search book calls the same problem, dysfunctional uterine bleeding. So they are kind of interchangeable, AUB and DUB, they mean the same thing. The book this year is a new version. It's the first time they've changed the terminology to be abnormal. So I just don't want you to see that later and be confused. Same thing. So this is any deviation from this normal cycle um, or the normal pattern. So we started out saying that the cycle should last three to seven days, 30 to 50 milliliters of blood loss, right? Not really crazy painful. It should happen about every 28 days. So these are variations, abnormalities to that cycle. It can be the um, amount, it can be the frequency, it can be the duration, it can even be the flow. So these little terms over off to the side are on your terms to know so that we can apply them to this situation. So this is not typically your pain. Notice the difference, dysmenorrhea, painful. Abnormal uterine bleeding is just change in that um, flow. So I put it right there for you, longer, heavier, frequent. So either they're coming shorter intervals or longer. This can occur at any age, but it's most often at the beginning or at the end of your reproductive years. And it's that change in your hormone levels again. So the young female who starts out, that cycle doesn't regulate for at least two years because of the hormone changes. As you get older in life, the hormones are starting to wane down, moving into menopause, and there can be some abnormal time frames in there too. So once again, this is another one of those things that the cause is kind of very generic and vague. It's usually a hormonal disturbance, but we have to test you know, some, some more details and we want to treat the underlying cause. I think that's why I have worse. I'm afraid it's Thomas on this stuff because it's like, I like why, and there's not always why, because it's different for every single female, okay? So there's little terms I gave you. I hope that you've seen that term scenario. You see that it's beneficial. I gave you some matching. I gave you some different ways to play with these words because you don't need to make 48 flashcards, okay? So hopefully that helps you out a little bit. So here are some probable causes of AUB. 
Um, adenomyosis is when that um, your endometrium grows into the actual musculature inside of the uterus. So, you know, it's supposed to be shed every month, right? It attaches like a barnacle. You see how that can cause some problems and some abnormal bleeding? Um, pregnancy can cause some abnormal bleeding. <coughs> Again, hormone imbalance, these are all real, real vague and has, has to be tested. We have to look at this person individually to determine where she falls into this continuum. And of course, you know, blood disorders, that could be a problem too, right? That's a big one to always think about here. So, bottom line is it is what it is. Don't make it any harder, okay? These are straight out of your book, medical management. They're bulletin for you. They're this easy to find. It's back to you treat your calls. So maybe they need estrogen. Maybe they need the uh, progestin or oral contraceptives. Remember, this isn't really painful, but the NSAIDs can help with the prostaglandin production, which can decrease that flow. Because one of these problems is that abnormal length of flow. So yet again, Motrin continues to be our friend. As later on, moving to closer to menopause, it is um, androgens. There's male hormones that we don't necessarily always have an overabundance of that our body starts to produce. So it might be that we need to regulate that out a little bit. And then iron salts are on here because we don't want to forget that if you are bleeding for a month straight, you might be running into some anemia issues and we want to be thinking about that. So iron stores or iron salts are on here as well. So we've looked at three big words, no period, right? We've looked at painful periods, and then we've looked at abnormal bleeding. So focus on those three words and apply those terms, okay? All right, endometriosis. This is the most common female gynecological issue. The um, bulk of this information, I believe, is in your med search book more so than your Ricci book, okay? So basically what endometriosis is, is there are little bitty pieces of this endometrial tissue that normally should be inside the uterus and shed every month, right? And it's picked up and moved outside of that uterine cavity, and now it's located inside this pelvic area for a female. The problem is, it still responds to hormones. So each month, as our cycles move through and those hormones are released, this tissue responds just like it would if it were in the right place. So there can be some bleeding, there can be pain. Typically what brings a female in to be seen are all those painful experiences they're having. The cycle is more painful, they're, they're having pain with sex, they're bleeding in between, they've got some bloating in their abdomen, and with diagnostic testing they are diagnosed later with endometriosis. So the exact cause is not known, but it's believed to have something to do with this um, retrograde or black backflow of this tissue throughout the cycle that causes this to occur. So, classic manifestations, dysmenorrhea. Is it primary or secondary? Secondary dysmenorrhea, absolutely. Dyspunorrhea, however you say that word. What's that mean? This means, and then the, the P A R E U N I A is sex. Painful sex. It should not hurt, right? That's not one of the words that should be used to describe that activity. Um, pelvic pain or pain into the back, because remember, this tissue now is located outside of the uterus. It is anywhere inside this pelvic cavity. Um, so it's responding to those hormones. Dysgesia is painful bowel movements. And it can radiate into the back and even down into the legs. So there really should not be a lot of, um, usually it's the, the pain complaint that brings the man to be seen. So definitive diagnosis. Absolute, this is what's wrong with you, bottom line period. You have to have laparoscopic procedures that can go in and actually visualize this tissue. And that's what it would look so laparoscopic is where they, they go through the abdomen wall with the lighted instrument. That was one of your terms I asked you to look at. And then they can see these little bits of endometrial tissue. You see this? 
that are outside of the uterus, which should not be. So now, it can be treated. Risk factors. Um, it's usually the older female, like we talked about with the dysmenorrhea. Uh, family history is another one. Yeah, any of those um, abnormal uterine cycle lengths, so you know, that short period, a long period, those are all risk factors. The, those words that we looked at, that abnormal uterine bleeding, remember this is an older female problem. I believe, I believe your book says like ages 30 to 48 year old, that's your window of time. So this is that secondary dysmenorrhea and there's abnormal changes to the flow. Those are all risk factors. Can that occur in your Sorry? Can it occur in your Oh yeah, yeah. It's just the average pain is that Okay. I want to repeat the question. Okay. I want to repeat the question. Oh, thank you. Yes. Dave, I need you so bad. Working on to know if this happened in younger females. Sure, anything can happen in anybody, right? But the window of time that um, this is looked at is usually 30 to 40 year old females because it is that main cause of secondary dysmenorrhea. So um, there are some treatments for this. And it depends on when it's caught. So we're going to look at that next. So for the pain and discomfort, imagine that we're going to give some incentives, right? Because of that whole prostaglandin. Um, inhibited properties that it has. Oral contraceptives can help cut down on the response to the hormones or any type of hormone therapy. So these are real vague and generic. They just are because again it's going to depend on the female herself. But this picture is that laparoscopic. Remember this is definitive diagnosis. So there are other ways it can be diagnosed I mean, or reasons why we would be looking for it. I don't want to say can be diagnosed because that's just not good. Um, if the female comes in with complaints of having um, painful sex, this crazy pain before period, these weird changes in abnormal flows, the questions we want to ask, we want to dig into that a little bit deeper and have her track her symptoms, and then there would be other testing done. You can have an abdominal ultrasound because then you would be able to see the structure of the pelvic cavity, but really being able to get in there and take a biopsy of this tissue is what determines that is what it is and stages where it's at, okay? So this is definitive. So there's um, treatment, conservative treatment would just be removal of that tissue. So if it's small bits and pieces and they can go in and just do it, that's conservative. The female would then be able to potentially have children. But if it is advanced stages, you have to have definitive treatment, which is removal of some of these organs. So hysterectomy is removal of one or both ovaries. Salpingo oophorectomy is the ovary in the tube. And then a hysterectomy would be the entire uterus. So the definitive is taking away the opportunity now for her to have children later on. So if we can be conservative, that's much better than the definitive. And it all really depends on when does the female come in. I'm sure you've all seen a little TV commercial with a woman sitting on the table, the exam table, the doctor's chair. How is everything? And she's like smiling. And use her little alter ego saying, Tell her it's terrible. Tell her it's all oh, really, really bad. Because then later wants to go to the doctor. Hey, gosh, it looks like it's really bad, right? So being able to use those open-ended questions and ask these questions is super important, especially when they're coming in complaining with their cycle problems, okay? We're going to look at some questions later on. This is all just real vague, right? It's really about what's going on with her. So let's go to med surgery, because that's why I love to be. We get some of these words out of the way. So diagnostic testing. So these are some labs and certain things we might do to look at some of these menstrual disorders. So what do you think of CBCs will tell us? Anemia. So we're looking at the hemoglobin and hematocrit, right? So a female, what's normal hemoglobin and hematocrit? Twenty four point four. Twelve to sixteen or eighteen. Okay. So 12 to 16 or 18. And remember, hematocrit, there should be, it's a three to one ratio. So if you're hemoglobin at 12, your hematocrit should be, say that's med surge. I like that, right? So we start to worry when we see low hemoglobin hematocrit because now we're thinking about 
thought loss, right? What else would the CBC tell us? Infection. We're going to talk about some good stuff next week, right? So it would tell us if there's a presence of infection. What else is in there? What's the other thing? Platelets, yeah, that clotting factor, because that's important, right? Remember, bleeding disorders can be part of the reason why I want to have AUV. So we want to look at those three big pieces. They're important for us to consider. A COAG panel, typically in med search, we think about heparin and coumadin with a COAG panel, right? But if it's indicated, we may be looking at that because that's going to tell us about their clotting times. Remember, if the number's really, really high here, that means it's taking what? Longer to clot. So the three things we look at in a COAG panel are PT, INR, and TT. What's normal PT? The time to review this stuff, right? Because that med surge was a while ago. Like 10 to 15 seconds, remember, because this is measuring time. And that INR is a ratio of that. So it's one, one and a half to two times the control. What about normal PT? Thirty to forty seconds is different. If I'm giving you coumadin, which one of these am I looking at? PT, PT, IR. Give me heparin, which am I looking at? See, that's good stuff, right? Oh, probably something we know. Makes me happy. What about a sed rate? What does sed rate tell us? Inflammation. Clearly, we need to kind of figure out what's going on. This TSH. We want to look at that, right, because we're worried about hypothyroidism. So remember, if it's low, everything's slow, and that certainly can cause a problem with the release of the hormone. <coughs> we didn't learn hard, fast numbers on that, so I'm not so worried about that. But your CBC, that's my number, right? I like that stuff. I'm a UA. We want to look at that UA for the presence of potential infection, but then, of course, we want to know, are you pregnant? Because that could be a primary cause of your uh, secondary amenorrhea. Right? Application of these words. You should be able to do that. Cervical culture, next week we're going to talk more about that with STDs and why we would do that and how you do that. An ultrasound is good. You can be either an abdominal ultrasound or a transvaginal ultrasound. But really, what that's going to do is help us look at that pelvic structure and make sure that it's intact and kind of laid out where it should be. A biopsy of tissue requires us to go up in there and get a little sample, and that has to be tested. And then laparoscopic is really definitive, because that gets you in there. You can actually visualize these structures, and then most of the time, that's how biopsies are done. And then a DNC, that is where the um, inside of your uterus gets scraped out, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Okay. That's hurt. I can't wait for that to come back in my tell. Not, you might really just love it in like female baby world. Oh, I got one, got one hand. Natasha probably is just in the Everybody else can go back and make search with me. Whew. Right? It's just sometimes I'll be when I've been in clinical and I'm talking out, I'm going up these words, I'm thinking, how do you know all these OB terms? Hush, you sound like you, you're an OB nurse, but just learn them and you learn to apply them. You just don't always want to. All right, let's get back to this. Nursing considerations for menstrual disorders. Okay, so this is gonna be any of those problems that we've talked about. Your blood breaks them down by the disorders, I just pull them all together for you because basically if you come in with a complaint, we need to kind of dig into this a little deeper. So past medical history, some of these problems can come from comorbidities, so we wanna know what your history is. Sexual history. Are you sexually active? <coughs> Are there multiple partners involved? Next week, we'll open our eyes to safe sex practices a little bit and get into that a little deeper. We want to know about her cycle history. If you are having trouble with your menstrual cycle, one of the first things that will be recommended uh, from a medical provider standpoint is that you track your symptoms for at least two months. Track your cycle. There are great little apps now, right? You throw it on your phone, you just press a button and it tracks it and lets you know when um, it started, when to expect it next. It'll trend your data and figure out are you a 28-day or are you a 32-day or what's happening in between. 
So those are great things to teach females to use, especially if you're having problems. Um, but not just the history, you want to know about the symptoms involved. Do they start to feel bad a few days before, physically, or even emotionally, what those changes are. Because we've been looking at physical problems, we're about to look at the emotional side of that. You want to know about medications that they're taking, because that can cause problems. And again, nutritional status. Are they eating balanced meals? Are they potentially anorexic, bulimic, or having any of those eating disorders that we're going to talk about? But balanced meals are super important. You want to know, when you get into the menstrual cycle part of it, you want to know about their pain and the associated symptoms. So these are all those real basic generic symptoms that we complain of. Nausea, vomiting, fatigue. Fever clearly is not normal, not an expected complaint. Headache, bloating, weight gain, muscle aches, cravings. And the cravings, you want to dig into that too. Remember salt intake, high intake can cause a problem. Chocolates loaded with caffeine, caffeine can cause a problem. So really try to figure out what they're consuming and what it is about. And then breast tenderness. The nursing management is just the basic education. It's that healthy lifestyle, making sure they're getting the exercise, they're um, not smoking, all those real generic things we talked about earlier. Actually, in this section of your book, it opens up with a little teaching box that says all the things you want to teach for menstrual disorders. Let's see if I put it on here. Um, yeah, box 4.2 talks about tips for maintaining a healthy lifestyle. Um, it's the diet, exercise, no smoking, avoid alcohol or, you know, not excessive alcohol intake during this time frame. And then the calcium, vitamin D, again, they don't necessarily know why that's beneficial, but it has been shown to decrease symptoms along with use of incense. Some of this is pretty intense and severe and they do recommend referrals to support groups, females with endometriosis, especially young females who want to have children. If this is a disease process, that opportunity may be removed for them if they have to have definitive treatment. So advocate for your patients is the bottom line here. Make sure they're getting the results that they want. Question on that part. Do you need a break before we hit these last two? So yes. Break. Okay, let's take like a five, ten minute break. Okay.